Father, we thank you so much for a revelation that is worth declaring. The more we think about these words that you have shared, and we just ponder them, generation after generation, they have brought comfort, they have raised a, um, an awareness, they have challenged men and women to love you and to love others deeply, to demonstrate something of your grace and your compassion and mercy. Circumstances that try us on a very human level, but when your spirit brings a level of empowerment and conviction, it is amazing to see what is accomplished. And so, Father, I pray that today would be another one of those days when having been confronted with the word, we leave that much more prepared and encouraged to live a life worthy of this calling. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I, I have it on a fair authority that in short period of time, we're actually gonna get a string of days where the temperature is above 32 or something. I mean, this is crazy, right? I mean, I, I wanted to warm up because I want to play a game of golf. I mean, I, I just, I'm not that good. And, uh, but I like to go out on the golf course and take a look at all this lawn that I don't have to mow. <laughs> I mean, it is awesome. I just stand there and I'm like, look at this, man. I don't have to mow a thing. It's like awesome. But you know, <clears throat> golf is a, a pretty demanding game. I mean, there's a lot of facets to it. I, 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 on occasion, I sit down with my wife and she and I have this conversation. And I try to explain to her why this game is so hard. And probably about 15 seconds into the conversation, I get this like glazed look like, I really don't care. You know, so I realized, all right, she doesn't really care. But when you think about it, I mean, there's so many different facets. I mean, like club selection. Like guys like me, it really doesn't matter actually. <laughs> but you know, what club should I use? Um, your swing, you know, is it consistent? You know, how do you manage weight on your feet so that you're not lunging at the ball or falling away from it, right? Then there's this whole idea of course management which again, doesn't really matter for a guy like me. <laughs> or wherever it is, I'm just gonna hit it. But some guys are really good, man. They know exactly where they want that ball to go. And, and if it hits this mark, it sets them up for the next shot. It's like a really good pool player, right? And then there's putting. You know, you gotta go into the ball, you know, with, with, a, with an even speed, you know, you don't just slap at it, and then you got a line. I mean, there's a thousand things that can go wrong, and they usually do with a guy like me. But I do have one story that is like awesome. We have been in a, I was playing in a, a, a fundraiser for Gordon College and uh, Doug Hawkins is one of the guys that comes here. I was part of a team and so we were playing and we really needed a putt, you know, to, uh, to, to win this tournament. And um, I was about 30 feet out and it was like this really uphill kind of a putt and it was like impossible. And it was my turn to go and there was a lot riding on it, and so I just turned around, and I looked at the guys, and I go, it is time for a miracle. <laughs> and I dropped the putt. Boom, right there. <laughs> so, it doesn't matter what I do from here on out, but that day, man, I was like the man. I was like waving, like, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, thank you. You know, the guys and the women that play in the PGA, they make it look easy, don't they? But you know that they have spent a lot of time learning how to adjust their game to various courses and situations. I wonder if, as we play at this game of life, if we do the same kind of course management. If we're really looking at the cultural landscape and taking a moment just to hit a pause button and instead of just living it out, we actually think about how are we engaging in this, in this life? How, how are we engaging the culture around us? And instead of just reacting, that we begin to think deeply enough so that the way we engage the world might actually really bring honor to God. 
So I think, are we skilled in the way in which we're addressing the marketplace? And so I have a question, I put it in your sermon notes page, and that, that is this, like what, what, what's an appropriate message to bring to the marketplace today? So we talk about matters of faith, like how, how do we do that in the world in which we live in? We've been spending a lot of time talking about the Apostle Paul and how this message began to unfold. And um, I just wanna go back for a moment and remind us that the journey that um, is continuing from a, from a place called Philippi. Um, he left Philippi, he goes from Amphipolis down to Apollonia to a, to a little town called Thessalonica. Now, if you look at the salmon colored you know, uh, region there, Asia, and you see that line being traced along the top, if you were here last week, you, you remember that Paul is on this missionary journey and God had him going and sharing this good news wherever he went, but he made it very clear that he wasn't going to, he didn't want him to preach the gospel in Asia, not at this time. And so it's kind of hard sometimes when you're being called to do something and you're not really sure where you're going. You're not sure what the end game is yet. It's kind of hard to stay motivated. You know, you heard it today, like when Ted Lee was talking about the song of prayer. It's like you, you, you're really energized to pray for something and then it doesn't seem to happen right away and the next thing you know, you kind of lose interest. So here, if, um, you know, if you, uh, if you just, if you look at the map, you, you see that that line brings them all the way to a place called Troas. And when they were in Troas, it was there that God gave a vision. And in that vision, he says, I want you to now go to this yellow region called Macedonia, and I want you to go there. Still not telling him exactly where it was gonna be and what he was gonna, who he was gonna meet, but if you were here last week and you've been following along, when he went to Philippi, he met a very prominent woman whose name was Lydia. And in that house of Lydia, she and all of her household, they came to know Jesus and they got baptized. And now in your Bibles, there is a book called the book of Philippians. And that, that grew out of that little house church that started there in Philippi, all because Paul decided that he was gonna be, he was gonna be obedient to this vision and God brings him all the way over there. And while he's there, he gets imprisoned, he gets flogged. And then he winds up also leading the Philippian jailer and his whole household to Christ. So there was, there was fruitful ministry for him but they left Philippi, they go to Thessalonica, and what I want you to see about that is it, there's a pattern now that we're beginning to, to see. Paul will go into a city, and one of the first things he does is he goes into the synagogue. And uh, there, you're meeting um, men, women who are familiar with this Old Testament that is filled with God's direction and his promises for his people. And so Paul then begins to preach Jesus from these promises. And the, uh, um, one of the things it says in Acts chapter 17, um, and I'll just read this to you. I didn't put it in your notes today, but it says that as was Paul's custom, he went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah, that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. And then he says, this Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. So in a setting where people were um, familiar with the promises that God made, Paul was now beginning to look at those promises in the ministry of Jesus and say, do you guys see that these things come together? And so as a result, many people came to know the Lord um, and uh, the result was that a church was established on various fronts and then typically trouble and some kind of opposition would come and um, would force them out of the city and they would go elsewhere. Um, this one time when he's in Thessalonica, the buzz around is that these guys are causing trouble all over the world. And that there is, they, are, they are proposing another king named Jesus. So this message that, G, uh, that Paul is beginning to give out, it is beginning to resonate with a lot of people and all kinds of questions, people are coming. So what, what takes place then is Paul moves on and as a result of this kind of persecution, he makes a, a hasty departure and he goes to another place called Berea. 
And, um, and so you look at, the mat, uh, at, at, at a map there, and you see that he goes from the synagogue there. He begins to preach again. And so you have those, those two arrows pointing to Philippi, to Thessalonica, and now to Berea. And while he's there, again, he preaches, people come, and then there's this opposition. And the opposition then forces them to put Paul in a boat, and he travels all the way down now to Athens. And while he's at Athens, that arrow on the bottom of the green section there, he enters into a whole other region of the world. And there he's about to um, open up the scriptures to them. So in your notes now, I wanna pick up the story from when Paul lands in the book of a Athens, and I wanna talk about this idea of proclaiming Jesus in the marketplace. And I think um, as we look at this passage, we're gonna get a couple of principles that we can take along with us. But in verse 16, if you follow along, it says Paul was waiting for them in Athens because he went alone this time. And so when he's in Athens, it says he's greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. If you know anything about that city of Athens, it still has some of the most beautiful architecture. Many of those temples, were, were dedicated to uh, like the goddess Athena. And so there's all these statues, all these things that are all around bearing witness to this belief in these, you know, uh, this, the system of various different kinds of gods. And so Paul goes into that city and he's distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Now, let me give you a little background, right? Paul was trained as a Pharisee. He, he understood the scriptures. And as a result, he was aware, as many of you are, of the Ten Commandments, a distillation uh, uh, of the law of Moses, right, into those ten. And so here it says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall make no graven image. You shall not bow down to them, right? You should not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. See, all, all these laws were meant as a way to keep people from engaging in the idolatry that they would find all around them. Because Paul understood that if your heart is weaned away from the things of God and it's put into this whole realm of these kinds of false worship, it's only gonna be a matter of time before you engage in behavior that's going to demonstrate that you no longer hold to the belief in a God who calls us to be righteous and holy, merciful. Now there's, there's going to be a shift, and it's always going to be about how I benefit from this. And it was over and over. You see it going everywhere they go. And so when Paul goes there and he sees all these idols, the text says, look at verse 17. He says, he went to the synagogue. And so he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing uh, Greeks. But now I want you to notice something else. It says as well as in the marketplace, day by day with those who happen to be there. So now Paul isn't just going to the synagogues, now Paul's going to where everybody is, you know, uh, living out life. He's going into the marketplace where people are living. So even those who perhaps had no time for the synagogue, now he's going out and he's talking to the people who are just rubbing shoulders with each other every single day. And while he's there, it says he meets a group of, of uh, philosophers. They're called Epicureans and Stoics. And he begins to dispute with them. Now, this is one of those areas that if you get a little bit of a, of a background on what this is really saying, it has great implication for what we live today. So I'm gonna take that challenge today and just talk a little bit about Epicureans and Stoics. And I wrote a little definition that you have in your notes so that you could take it along with you. As we, as we continue, but let me, let me just start off by just saying that Epicureans were established by a man named Epicurus at the time of Paul's writing 300 years earlier. So the fact that they are still gathering and thinking about the content of this guy's philosophy of life is a testimony to how long standing this has been. And now the Epicureans, they believe that if there was a God, that he came and he kind of basically kind of wound the clock. He got everything started. And then he just left the scene, having very little to do with human beings. And so they saw as the ideal kind of a life then was a life that was independent, 
untroubled, unworried about larger questions, including that of one's own destiny. They didn't believe in the immortality of a man's soul. What they did believe in was the pleasure of tranquility, of peace, and that that was to be found in the absence of any kind of pain. Now, you would think that kind of philosophy would lead somebody to pure, unadulterated hedonism. But Epicurus was a principled man. In his own writings, he would tell people, he says, look, if, if there is too much pleasure, it can lead to pain. Anybody say amen to that? You pursue pleasure too much, it could result. It's a very negative consequences. And he also understood that sometimes pain can be a great motivator that could actually lead us to better pleasure. Because you learn things from pain and it could enhance your life. So for Epicurus, his idea was, hey, let's try to find that zone where we can live and the experiences that we have in this life, they flow from a place where we just kind of like live that perpetual chill. We're just getting along, man, just enjoying life so that your experiences in life, those kinds of, uh, uh, of the way you engage the world is through your emotions, that somehow or another, you're not gonna be too high, you won't be too low, you'll kind of be just like, just chilling. Does that sound like anything that people are interested in today? Come on, you know exactly. I mean, just listen to most of the songs, everything that's out there, it's always appealing to our emotional side to find ourselves in this space, man. We were just like, getting along, baby. Life is good. You know, life is a beach. In contrast to that, you have the Stoics. The Stoics, they believe that divinity lay within the present world, within each human being, so that this divine force, it wasn't personal, it was just like this guiding kind of a principle and you could tap into that. And the way in which you would do that was that you began to get in touch with this inner rationality, which was another way of talking about logic. It was a way of approaching the world through observation and making conclusions. But the presupposition there was that you lived in a world that you're only going to be able to um, really base your life on what can be observed and what can be, you know, uh, reasoned out. So you live life less on your emotions and more on logic. Anybody meet people like that? So now you have these two kinds of thoughts where people are approaching life from two very different kind of vantage points, right? One from the heart, how I feel, how I engage. I'm an, an emotional kind of a person. And, and, and so I begin to think of reality as it's manifested this way because it has to feel real to me. Okay, well, you know, you ever find yourself in a place where you can be so convinced about something and then you find out that even though you were sincere and honest, you were sincerely and honestly wrong. And how about logic? Logic goes to just so far, right? I mean, if I, leave, if I believe I live in a closed system, then, then anything that bucks up against that is considered to be irrational. And if I've already made those kinds of determinations, don't you see how where you start has everything to do with how you live? How, how now you're gonna play your life out? And you get that all the time, that's how people live. So into this milieu then, which is part of the marketplace, and I would suggest it's still pretty much the way it is today, the Apostle Paul is gonna enter into that and he's going to speak to them. Now notice what they say here, we go back to our text. Some of them in verse 18 begin to ask him and they say, what is this babbler trying to say? That word babbler is a, is a word that um, was a really a derisive kind of a term that the Athenians used for people that would go around collecting and selling refuse that they would find. It was a term that was used for men of no account who were low and contemptible. And so it was a term of derision. So they're like, what's this babbler trying to say? And, um, and so they, they were treating Paul here rather condescendingly, like, they knew, he didn't, and so what's this guy doing? Some said he seems to be advocating foreign gods. And then it goes on to say, they said this 
because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Now, what I want you to know is that the word for resurrection is a Greek word called anastasis. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a word, it's a, it's a feminine word. And so from the text, many commentators believe that when they said that he was advocating foreign gods, they were thinking like, okay, well, now you have Jesus and then this foreign god, Anastasis. And they never heard this before. Now, why would that matter so much? They, they go on and they, they say, we want you to bring you to this meeting of the Areopagus, a, uh, a place where they would gather and they would often debate ideas and, and have these talks. And they say, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting. You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we wanna know what they mean. Because the new teaching that they're bringing doesn't seem to coincide with, at least for the Epicureans who've been following this thing for 300 years. So when Paul goes and he starts to talk to them, they, um, not only are they condescending, but they're also very suspicious. They wanna know what this is about. I learned something this past week in my studies. One of the writers um, put it this way. He says, you know, the charge of preaching foreign divinities was the charge on which Socrates, one of the greatest philosophers of all time, had been tried and condemned. Athens may have been interested in new ideas, but divinities from elsewhere could easily get you into trouble, some serious trouble. And so now you have them talking about Paul. And so now you're left thinking, okay, well, what's this guy gonna say? When he enters into the arena where all these people have their ideas, what is it that he's going to say to them in this marketplace? And so in verse 22, it says, Paul stood up at the meeting of the Areopagus and he says to the men of Athens, I see that in every city you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Now what you worship is something unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you. Now, isn't that interesting? When you hear that text, how does it fall on your ears? When, when Paul, he's, he's trying to be magnanimous, right? He's, you already are told that he's distressed inwardly because of all of this false worship that's taking place, all these idols that are in the city. It, it, it's just really an offense to him and all that, that he understood about what God was wanting us to know about him. So he's in this midst, and so he starts off trying to build a little bridge with the people who are sitting there, right? These Epicureans and Stoics. And he says, look, outwardly, it appears that you guys are religious, right? And um, he says, there are signs everywhere that point to it. No doubt that the Parthenon, a temple dedicated to Athens that people still go now and visit, was still there. I mean, you know, uh, dedicated to the temple, uh, to the goddess Athena. And so he goes to them and he says, look, what you know is unknown, I'm going to declare to you. When you hear that, does that not smack of, you know, being kind of brash? Like when you hear him say that, does part of you think like, hmm, that's kind of bold. Like, why would he go there and tell people like, look, you don't really know something and I'm, what you don't know, I'm gonna tell you. We, we kind of think like, well, come on, you should be a little bit more magnanimous than that, man. Everybody has a way of thinking and, doesn't necessarily mean you're right and he's wrong. We should just, we should become more tolerant of these ideas. Which is another way of just saying, do you see how as our culture, the minute you, you read something like that in the text and the fact that you even start to think that way, it goes to show like, wow, the, the culture around us does influence the way in which people engage. And so Paul is clear, he's saying, look, you guys are saying something can't be known. And by saying that, they're erecting some absolutes. I, I love it when people do that, because when they say, they'll say, they'll, they'll say to me, they're like, well, I don't believe that there are any absolutes. And I smile and I go, well, you just made one. Because to say that there are none is suggesting that you know something, right? That, that's an absolute then. So there, this little 
inscription to an unknown God may come from a place where people think like, well, if there is a God, nobody's really ever going to get to know him, really know him. And Paul is here to say, no, you can know him. And so while they are outwardly focused, you could see that they are inward. I mean, they are outwardly religious. They are inwardly focused. It's all about what's going on in their own head. It's, it's about the way in which they are beginning to build, you know, a, a philosophy on which people will engage life. And I would suggest that we all do that. And what we're asking now is for the scriptures and this life of Jesus to begin to inform our lives so that we make better decisions, that we, that we grow with, uh, with a deeper sense of purpose and I would say that while Epicurus may have been around for 300 years, the revelation that God gave to the Israelites is the oldest that's out there. He made heaven and earth, created man in his own image. So Paul's mission is clear. I'm what you worship as something unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you. And so he starts. And so what I'd like to do in the remainder of our time this morning is to give you a number of things that show you how Paul engaged this marketplace, and then perhaps we could take some of that with us. Paul starts this way. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. See, what God is saying in this, what Paul is saying here is that God is first cause. God is the creator. He's the Lord over all of his creation. He is not distant from creation. Rather, he watches over it. When he says that God made the world and everything in it, he said he's also the Lord of heaven and earth. So while God created all things, it's not like he wound the clock and then went away. God's still very much a part of the world in which we're living. And so if I'm buying into a philosophy of life that says somehow or another, if there were gods and they were engaged in some kind of grand design, they are so far removed from us, they have no impact on my life. So therefore, I got to find my own way to making sense on what I'm going to do with the life that God has given me. And Paul now is declaring to them that the God who created all things is the Lord of heaven and earth. Man, that is a volley on the other side of the net that seems already now to put everybody a little bit at attention. Then he goes on, he says, and, and uh, the Lord of heaven and earth, he says he does not live in temples built by hands and he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. So again, we go back to this sense that God isn't you know, in need of all these, um, you know, gestures that uh, men and women are bringing to him. He doesn't need these temples. He doesn't need anything. Because he, he stands above his creation. God created all these things for his good pleasure. Now, we live in a day and an age where every, all the talk of being green, right, and loving the planet, and, you know, uh, we talk about, you know, tree huggers, and, well, hey, there's nothing wrong with hugging a tree. When my kids, uh, they were younger, we moved from New York to Oregon, and um, to get them a little bit more acclimated to this move, we flew into San Francisco, um, we got a car, and then we drove up the coastline up to, to uh, Oregon and we took, you know, uh, the better part of a week. Along the way, we made a bunch of stops. And one of those stops was in the Redwood Forest and we saw those huge sequoia trees, man. They were just like, I mean, just massive. Some of those trees had, you know, um, t you know like arches cut into them. You could drive your car right through them. And um, we had one of those pictures where everybody gets out and we were holding hands trying to see how far around the, the tree we can get. So um, you could hug this tree, but never be mistaken that the tree is God. We don't worship nature. We worship, according to what Paul says here, if a God, he made the world, everything in it, he doesn't live in temples made by hands, he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. What he's saying to us is God stands above his creation. I love the way, I had a, a, a theology professor 
and uh, his name was Dr. Rudolph, and Dr. Rudolph had this saying that he would say all the time, referring to God and creation, and he'd say, he is not it, and it is not he. So while we can appreciate the creation all around us, we don't serve creation, we serve a God who created all things. And then Paul goes on and he says to them that, um, in fact, God is a provider because he goes on, he says, you know, he doesn't need anything because why? He himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. And then he defines what he means by all men because he says, from one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. So not only did God create the world and is, and, you know, um, is engaged, though he stands above it, he's intimately involved with it. God is intimately involved with his creation. Notice it says here, God gives man life, breath, everything else for life. So if God is gonna be the one that becomes this sense of center for how we engage the world, then to engage the world and not pay attention to the way in which God ordered us and the world is to keep ourselves at arm's distance from the one who could bring a sense of meaning into a person's life. And by God saying, look, I'm the one that populated the world. I'm the one that established all the nations. And while we want to have this sense of power and ownership over my own life, God saying, no, 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 no. I am the one that sets man's time and his boundaries. Don't you wish you had that power? We kind of act like we do. Like, man, I have all these choices. I, I'm, the, I'm the captain of my own ship, really. We all wish that we could put a little bit more sand in that hourglass. We'd all wish that we didn't have some of the encumbrances and obstacles that life comes with. Sometimes they're not any of your own design, it just happens, that's the way life works itself out. But ultimately it says that God, intimately involved with its creation, gives them everything they need for life and breath. He's the one who sets the, the boundaries. Very different from what these Epicureans and Stoics were believing, right? Instead of this God who is distant, he's a God who's very much present. And then he goes on and he says, and God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own prophets have said, we are his offspring. You know, a fish was designed to swim in water. You watch him in his own habitat, and it's amazing, some of these creatures. You take that fish and you take him out of water, he's no longer free. If we were created in God's image, if we are God's offspring, if we are to live and move and have our being in him, then to make a choice where we keep now God at arm's distance and we say, well, thank you very much, but I'm gonna do my own thing right now. We put ourselves at great risk. See, what God is saying is if we seek after him, God can be known. Completely different from what the Epicureans and Stoics believed. They're trying to find meaning in a sense of my own experiences. I'm trying to find meaning inside this brain, trying to come to terms with the world as I see it. And God's saying, you're never gonna really get the full explanation of what I've done in that manner. I heard one philosopher one time say it this way. He says, it's like a person takes a, a, a teacup and goes to the ocean and dips the water and then comes back to someone who has never seen the ocean and then tries to explain to them the ocean from a teacup of water. How are you gonna explain the, imme the immenseness of who God is 
thinking that you're just going to find it by your own emotion or your own sense of rationality. You need a special revelation. You need God to disclose himself. And what God is saying to us that everything that was created by which he superintends and is intimately, uh, you know, uh, engaged in it, he says, I've done so that you might know me. That if you seek me, you will find me. That's as old as you look at passages like Jeremiah where he says, you will, if you seek for me, you will find me if you seek for me with all of your heart. Or Proverbs, lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your crooked paths straight. You see, this is what God is trying to say to the Epicurean and Stoics in this marketplace. And then all of this comes to a head then in Paul's speech in verse 29, when he says, therefore, based on what I've said, therefore, since we are God's offspring... We should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In other words, you don't have the right to define who you think God is. God is the one who defines himself, and God is the one who gives definition to you. He'll tell you a little bit about how you have been created and for what purposes. And that kind of perspective now brings into your sphere of consciousness now that I have been made in the image of God. I have value. I have divine purpose. Then he says this, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. You know, sometimes people can get so engaged in their life that they think it's just about them. It's about trying, like the Epicurean, to find a place where I can just find this zone that I can live in and be at peace with myself in this environment. And I'm striving after that. And I'm trying to find the ways to do that. But here, when you look at this text, it's now saying that, no, no, no. As God's offspring, God has an end game in mind. That end game is going to be about redemption. That end game is about how he says in the text here, he's going to judge the world. And so as God's offspring, there is a level of accountability. You are not your own. You were created in his image, and if you know Jesus, you were bought with a price. That means that your life, it, it's going somewhere. It's as the, as the sand in your hourglass begins to fall, and you are being made, you're being made more and more aware of your own mortality, Rest assured of this, according to the text that we have in front of us, Paul is declaring that God says that a day is coming when he's going to judge the world with justice by the man that he has appointed. And to show you proof of that, it says he raised this man from the dead. He's talking about Jesus. So Jesus is the one now, by virtue of his resurrection, stands above all things because he is God. I am the resurrection and the life. No man comes to the Father, right? He says, though he were dead, believing in me, yet shall he live. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And now Jesus comes and says, I am inaugurating now this this time when there's going to be a level of accountability brought to the world. And so you might have the luxury in your own head to think that I can choose to live the way I want. I'll be an Epicurean, right? Living on my emotion. I'll live over here, all inside my head. Great, go go at it. But you do realize that a day is coming when you're gonna stand before a God who gives you life and breath and everything that you need for this life. 
You do realize that it is in him that we live and move and have our very being. And if you've ever been brought to a place in your life where life has become unmanageable for you, you're suddenly aware that I have very little in terms of power. You let someone that you love get sick and then you recognize I, I can sell all that I have, man, and I, I may not be able to turn back the time here. Or things that you want in your life and you can't get them. No, no, you see, we live and move and have our very being in our relationship with him. And that's the thing that very often people, they go on with their life and they never even think about it. We get all kinds of diversion with careers and and entertainment, and, and we just, the time just goes away. And what the Apostle Paul is saying to these group of philosophers is that you're all accountable to a living God. And you know what the response is? Some of them dismiss him. If you read through the end of Acts chapter 17, you'll find that it says that some sneered. Others said, yeah, we'll hear you again on this matter. But as always, those who hear the truth being proclaimed, there was a few. And one of those was a member of this astute society. His name was Dionysus. And it says Dionysus came to believe. And there was a woman in that crowd who, being that she singled out, she probably was a very prominent woman in that city of Athens. Her name was Damaris. And she came to know Jesus, as well as many others. So while some were dismissive, others believed. So let me land the plane here now for you. God has provided us with a lens to understand the world and the part that we are playing in it. And unfortunately, many people have sought to rewrite the script and oftentimes to their own demise. Because we wanna do what I wanna do. We think that this life is for me to do whatever I feel like with it, rather than the fact that as one who is made in the image of God, God is calling you to honor him and honor his creation by living life in the light of his word. We've placed ourselves as the master of our own destiny. And it's a view that has brought us to a place where we are at odds with God's purposes. So for instance, if I think I can ignore everything that God is saying to me about the way in which I am to live, and I go away from that totally unscathed, you're living in a deception. Because one day you're gonna stand and have to give an account for your life. Now, you may not choose to have that philosophy. It's okay. But if Paul is correct, all of creation derives its being from him. And that will make that meeting very different. Now, let me just say, how is it that people sometimes could become so deceived in that place? Well, let me end by just saying two things. One, I think that people have an overestimated view of progress. They think, well, things will just get better and we'll learn and we'll improve and we're gonna be on this path, you know, to, to make, to, 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 to reach a place where it'll be like heaven on earth, really. Looking back on our own history, is that the way it's been? Do you feel more safe today than you did a generation ago? Do you feel like the world is a much friendlier place? That we're just a few steps away from everybody singing Kumbaya? Or do you worry for your kids and your grandkids? You worry about this world that they're going to be inheriting. 
But if you give yourself to, hey, progress, I'm just saying that we've turned a blind eye to all the unintended consequences of what we thought was progress. You know what the other ill that I think happens that people just suck down like without even thinking? Is if we overestimate progress, we wind up minimizing evil. And we choose instead to see the root of the turmoil that's in the world not coming from a heart of man that now is separated from their relationship with God. We look at the root of the turmoil in the world based on ignorance. If people just were better educated, if they just knew better, no. Do we not look around and see very intelligent people that have invented ways to kill people? Do we have not seen people who have great capacity use that capacity for their own self-serving? Come on, the world is filled with stuff like that, and we just turn a blind eye to it and think, well, you know, it's just, they just don't know better. No, they do know better. That's the problem. Evil is in the world. Jesus said, it's out of the heart that comes all kinds of malice and envy and hatred and murder. And what Paul has been declaring from city after city after city is that the way for a heart to be healed is to come under the mercy and compassion of his son, Jesus. Who says, if you labor and are heavily burdened, come unto me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. You'll find rest for your soul. So where are you trying to find that sense of meaning in your own life? You see what Paul did on that day standing in the marketplace, not in the synagogue where everybody had their Bibles out and were looking at all the promises. No, I'm talking about the marketplace of ideas. What Paul did was, that, was, was to make everybody aware that this is not just for one little group of people. This is for the world, Epicurean, Stoic, Jew, scholar, it doesn't matter. One God made all the nations of the world and this one God is the God that one day you are gonna stand before him and give an account for what you have done with your life. In the shadow of a redemption that Jesus purchased for you with his own blood. See, what is the message we need to bring to the marketplace? God is not distant. And we're not to look to the creation to give us direction because he stands above it. But we can see in it something of his power and of his glory. That God is involved, he's not distant. That he can be known. And here's a tough one. And people don't often like to say it, but I'm gonna tell you the truth. The truth is that we need to repent while there's still opportunity. You can't go on living your life the way you feel like it and think that there's gonna be peace between you and God. You hear that? And I know that you can turn on the TV and you can get other people talking about the best life is yet to come. And I know they want to appeal to all this sense of security and safety. But you don't even have to take my word for it. Just read through the scriptures and you'll find that God says he is for you. He will never leave you, never forsake you. But that you live in a world that is broken and the only one that can fix it is him. And he has chosen for reasons that, honestly, when I get to heaven, I'm gonna probably ask him a bunch of questions. But all I know is that what he has revealed is that he is going to bring redemption through our relationship with Jesus. Because as I take Jesus and his word seriously, it has a way now of defining morality for me. 
It has a way of defining what it means to love. It has a way of recognizing that I extend mercy and compassion, not because people deserve it, but because they bear the image of God. And I am to honor that. So I forgive 70 times seven. I am to love all kinds of people. We live in a day and an age right now where people talk about being open and affirming. And you could use that terminology for a whole host of things. Believers ought to be open to all people to demonstrate a love that far exceeds anything that the world can offer. But what we are called to affirm is a biblical righteousness that finds its core and its articulation in the person of Jesus. Because a day is coming, as he just told us in the text, when he will judge the world with justice by the man that he has appointed. That's Jesus. So it's a wake-up call for all of us. But it's also a promise of great freedom to live life with that sense of confidence. To understand that when I wake up in the morning, I am never far from his gaze. That even though I may experience trials in this broken world, they're not for naught, because he says he redeems them all. That, like he says in James, consider it pure joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the trying of your faith is ultimately going to make you complete. And if you lack wisdom, ask God and he'll give it to you. I don't know about you, but it gives me a sense of of centeredness. And that's what God is offering to each and every one of you. That's what Paul was doing when he went from city to city to city. Saying, you don't have to make it up. I'm here for you. That's the good news of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the clarity by which the Apostle Paul has shared. I think of the scriptures. You open them up and there is this two letters that he wrote to the church in Thessalonica, church in Philippi, and others as we will come to see as we go through this book of Acts, sharing a biblical perspective on you and the role that we are to play in this life. And if we were to allow room in our life for it, we'd become all the better for it. And what we're chasing for in so many other directions, we will find a healthy identity, a purpose, and a joy that comes from your spirit living within us. One of the greatest promises for me, as I spend time in the scripture, was the promise when God said that because of the spirit living in me, the fruit of that spirit is mine. The fruit of love and joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, kindness, self-control. All those virtues, it says, begins to grow inside of that man and that woman who opens their life to the great promises of Jesus. I pray that you would do that work in us. I pray that as a church, that would be our all-consuming mission, to be disciples and to make disciples. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise in Christ's name, amen.